Okay, so when we last left off, we were discussing drawing Lewis structures, resonance structures, and drawing constitutional isomers. So what I would like everyone to work on just to start off today's class session is to attempt to draw a valid Lewis structure for the following formula. This, this is isothiocyanate anion. And the really nice thing about this particular anion is that it serves as a wonderful representative example of not only drawing resonance structures, but also drawing constitutional isomers. So what I'd like us to start off on is to try to draw a valid Lewis structure for the following anion, and then to draw one valid constitutional isomer for that formula. So we'll spend about four to five minutes on this, exam on this example, and then we'll discuss momentarily. And if you have any questions when working through this example, don't be shy to type them in the chat. Yes, so in one of the constitutional isomers, you can have carbon as the central atom. But note, when you're trying to draw multiple constitutional isomers, you can just as easily place nitrogen, for example, as a central atom. But your proposed Lewis structure that you've drawn looks perfectly correct. So that's one of the constitutional isomers that you can draw. And remember, constitutional isomers have the same formula, but a different connectivity. So we'll discuss this example in about another three to four minutes. And if you have any questions, don't be shy to type them in the chat. Yep, exactly right. The proposed second constitutional isomer that I see looks perfectly correct. And we'll discuss this example in about three minutes. And if you have any questions, don't be shy to ask them in the chat. And don't be shy if you want to try to draw your proposed structure using the annotate feature. and we'll discuss in about another two minutes, just to give everyone enough time to try to draw the structure and rearrange the connectivity of atoms to generate the different constitutional isomers for this Lewis structure. Okay, so let's discuss this example. So sulfur has six electrons, carbon has four electrons, nitrogen has five electrons. That gives us a total of 15 electrons plus one. Because we have a minus one charge, that gives us 16 electrons. We're gonna try to place carbon as our central atom and surround it with sulfur and nitrogen. Then 
following our procedure, we form one bond each. We have 12 electrons remaining. And now we take our 12 electrons and we place them on our outermost nitrogen and sulfur atoms. We've used up our electrons. Now my question to all of you is, does carbon have a complete octet? Does carbon have a complete octet as drawn? No. So then, how do I how do I, how should I complete the octet for carbon? Which atom should I move lone pairs down from? You can have the double bond on both sides, sure. And that would give us the following structure. If we think about the formal charges, we see that the formal charge of sulfur would be six minus four minus two, which gives us zero. Formal charge of carbon is four minus four, which gives us zero. And the formal charge of nitrogen is five minus four minus two, which is negative one. So that's a reasonable structure. It's not incorrect by any means but there's actually a slightly better structure. And let's look at the following structure and let's try to assess why this structure drawn is slightly more preferred. So looking at this following structure, this second structure is actually a more, a more representative structure for the following formula. And the reason for that is if we start to look at our formal charges, what do we notice about the formal charges in this molecule? Where, where is our negative formal charge located? Where is our negative formal charge located? Sulfur, yep. We'd have our negative formal charge on sulfur. In general, you try to place the negative charge on the more electronegative element. Both of these structures are very, very close in terms of contribution because nitrogen and sulfur are pretty close in terms of electronegativity. Um, so both structures would be accepted on the exam. These two structures are actually resonance structures because they're the same connectivity of atoms with a slightly different distribution of electrons. Okay. Now, let's take what we've seen for the following formula and let's try to draw a constitutional isomer. So we have the following. Uh, if sulfur forms a triple bond, that would be a, a that would be a structure. However, it places a positive formal charge on sulfur, so it's not very highly preferred. Does that make sense? So the logic is fine in terms of the octet rule. It just would not have very good formal charges. So in terms of drawing a valid constitutional isomer, ah, so sulfur is slight, so thinking about electronegativity, it's very close. In general, you wanna place the negative charge on the more electronegative atom. In this case, it's very, it's pretty close. In general, atoms like sulfur and oxygen prefer to have a negative charge over atoms like nitrogen. Though I, again, I, I have to emphasize, this is a very, very, small difference between these two structures and both would be accepted. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's now try given our given our initial skeleton to draw some constitutional isomers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap carbon and nitrogen, and that in turn, 
will give me the following constitutional isomer. So we have sulfur connected to nitrogen. One moment. So we have sulfur connected to nitrogen, which is connected to carbon. Okay. So let's now start off with our basic skeleton. Let's draw one bond each. So we have 12 electrons to work with. And now let's place our lone pairs. We place our lone pairs on sulfur and carbon, and we've used up all of our electrons. Now, to fulfill the octet for nitrogen, we form additional bonds. And how many additional bonds does nitrogen need in the following structure? How many additional bonds does nitrogen need in the following structure? Two, yep. So we're gonna take them from carbon and we're gonna form two bonds with carbon. The reason for that and the reason why we chose this structure for a constitutional isomer is that we have a formal charge of sulfur of six minus six minus one, which is negative one, and a formal charge of carbon in this case of four minus three minus one, which is negative one, and a formal charge of nitrogen of five minus four, which is positive one. Now, if we compare that to our other option, so some students may have suggested, oh, we could draw a structure that looks like this. Well, this is a resonance structure for this constitutional isomer. And if we look at the formal charges, we see that the formal charge of sulfur, although the formal charge of sulfur is zero, we have a formal charge of nitrogen of five minus four, which is plus one, and a formal charge for carbon. In this case, we're missing a lone pair, one moment. We end up with a formal charge of carbon, in this case, of four minus four minus two of negative two. Now, in general, do we prefer structures with large formal charges or small formal charges? In general, do we prefer structures with large or small formal charges? Small, yep. So this first structure is preferred because we minimize our formal charges in terms of we have the smallest possible formal charges and we are placing our negative formal charges on the more electronegative elements. Okay, so let's take a look and given we have the following structure for isothiocyanate anion. My question to all of you is, I'd like you now to draw two resonance structures at least. I'd like you to assign formal charges to each atom and tell me which of the resonance structures is more preferred, which resonance structure minimizes formal charges, follows the octet rule more readily, and places its formal charges on the correct atoms. So negative formal charges on more electronegative atoms. And then I'd like you using the resonance structures to answer the question, what is the bond order for the sulfur carbon bond? And what is the bond order for the carbon nitrogen bond? So try drawing a few resonance structures, and then I'd like you to submit responses to these two comprehension questions in the chat. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. Did that help? 
Were you able to write down what you needed to from the upper section of the notes? Perfect. So let's spend about three to four minutes on this example and I'd like to see a few responses into this in the chat. Into the bond order of the sulfur carbon bond and the bond order of the carbon nitrogen bond. and we'll discuss in about three minutes. And let's try to get some responses in the chat for the bond order of these two requested bonds. and try drawing each of the resonance structures and then considering which structure is most preferred when you take your average. So the bond order may be a little bit greater, a little bit less than two, and your job is to, using the resonance structures, to deduce whether your bond order is exactly two, greater than two, or less than two. And the key feature of this problem is that each of our, so two is very close to the average, but when you average your resonance structures, the more preferred structures have a greater weight in your bond orders. Did that answer your question? So one of the three resonance structures that you've drawn has a greater contribution. And in turn, your actual structure would, will have a bond order more closely matching your major contributing structure. Okay, so let's discuss. So we can rearrange our electrons using arrow pushing. So we can kick down our nitrogen electrons to generate the following resonance structure. Okay, we can also kick down our sulfur electrons to generate the following resonance structure. Not entirely formal arrow pushing notation, but it's essentially helping everyone see how we're rearranging our electron density. Okay, so now that we have, now that we have each of our resonance structures, if we had to rank these resonance structures in terms of their contributions, which structure is most preferred? Which structure places negative formal charges on the most electronegative elements and which structures 
overall minimize our formal charges. So if we have structure A, B, and C, which structure is the greatest contributor? Which structures are greater contributors? Which structures are minimizing formal charges and placing negative formal charges on electronegative elements? Structure B, yep, so structure B is major. What other structures are major and preferred? Which other structures also minimize formal charges and place negative formal charges on electronegative atoms? So B is one of our major structures. What else? Is there another major structure from these three resonance structures? So looking at structure C, does structure C minimize our formal charges or does it have large formal charges? If you're just looking at structure C alone, is structure C preferred or not preferred? So is structure C preferred or not preferred? It's not preferred. So structure C is minor. And structure A, although it's not perfect, it's still pretty good. So it would be considered a major structure. We have negative formal charges on nitrogen. We're following the octet rule. And our formal charges aren't too large. So then, when we calculate our weighted average, A and B are going to be considered with greater weight in determining our resonance hybrid or our average bond order and average charge on each of our atoms. Structure C is minor and doesn't contribute substantially to our average resonance bond lengths and bond strengths in our actual compound. So for example, if we wanted to figure out the bond order in the sulfur carbon bond, let's look at only our major contributors. So from our major contributors, what is the bond order for our sulfur carbon bond for our major contributors? What is the sulfur carbon bond order in our first major contributor? What is the sulfur carbon bond order? Just looking at the, this major structure A. What is the sulfur carbon bond order in structure A? Two, yep. Okay, what is the sulfur carbon bond order in, stru in structure B? one so two plus one and now we're going to take the average bond order only from our major resonance contributors and then we're going to divide by our total number of resonance structures and that gives us a bond order of 1.5 so major resonance structures just like preferred lewis structures follow the octet rule minimize formal charges and place negative formal charges on electronegative atoms and positive formal charges on less electronegative atoms. So structures A and B are major, so we take the average bond length in each of our major resonance structure, so we take our average bond order only from each of our major resonance structures to calculate the actual bond order for this compound. C is minor because, as we noticed, it has larger formal charges and it places a positive formal charge on a very electronegative atom, such as sulfur. In general, we want to minimize, we want to have small formal charges, and we want to place negative formal charges 
on more electronegative atoms. Yep, exactly right. Mm -hmm. So then, would someone like to help me out? What would the bond order be for the carbon-nitrogen bond in structure A? What would the bond order be for the carbon-nitrogen bond in structure A? So for structure A, our bond order is two. And for structure B, as a student has pointed out in the, in the chat, the bond order is three. So if we take the average bond order, we get an average bond order of 2.5. So our average, our resonance hybrid structure would look a little bit like this. where we have a bond order of about one and a half for our sulfur carbon bond and a bond order of about two and a half for our carbon nitrogen bond. So the electrons in this conjugated system are distributed about all three of our bonded atoms participating in resonance. Does this idea make sense to everyone? Does this idea that resonance structures can have different contributions depending on their distribution of formal charges and how closely the, each of the resonance structures follow the octet rule. Major resonance structures have more weight in terms of calculations for figuring out the bond order for bonds in your actual structure. Does that make sense? Any questions on this example? Any other questions on this example? Okay, so let's keep going now and let's talk about expanded octets. So in expanded octets, elements that are in N equals three or the third row You can use the periodic table for electronegativity. But yes, for this chapter, the electronegativity chart that I provided at the beginning of this chapter and last chapter would be very useful to have handy. So moving back to expanded octets, elements in n equals three and below or in the third row and below have access to d orbitals. Now, although for n equals three elements, the d orbitals are empty, these d orbitals can still participate in chemical bonding. So for example, sulfur hexafluoride can form more than just four bonds. It can actually form up to six bonds using the d orbitals. So in this case for sulfur, so for sulfur hexafluoride, sulfur contributes six electrons, fluorine contributes seven electrons, and we have six fluorines. That gives us 48 electrons to work with. We place sulfur as our central atom, and this time we can surround sulfur with more than four atoms. So expanded octet atoms can accommodate up to six surrounding atoms. And this only applies because sulfur is in the third row of the periodic table or below. So don't draw an expanded octet carbon or anything of that sort. 
Now that we have our rough skeleton in place, we're gonna form one bond each, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. So we're gonna end up with 36 electrons. Now, what atom does not have a complete octet? What atom does not have a complete octet? Sulfur is perfectly fine, but what about the other atoms? What atoms have an incomplete octet so far? What atoms need additional lone pair electrons? Which atoms have an incomplete octet? Fluorine, yep. So fluorine needs six electrons. So we're gonna give each of our fluorine atoms six lone pair electrons. That in turn means we've used up all 36 of our electrons and this structure is complete. Let's do a quick calculation for the formal charge of sulfur. And that really can help us understand why we can see expanded octet arrangements. So the formal charge of sulfur, we have a group number of six, we form six bonds. That gives us a formal charge of sulfur of zero. Okay, let's look at the formal charge of fluorine. We have a group number of seven. We form one bond and we have six lone pair electrons. That gives us a formal charge of zero. You may notice that in many cases for expanded octet structures, expanded octets are adopted or drawn in order to minimize formal charges. So does, does this idea of expanded octets make sense to everyone? It applies only for elements in the third row and below. So I don't want to see, and I really don't want to see oxygen hexafluoride. Do not draw this. And why is oxygen hexafluoride not allowed? Why is oxygen hexafluoride not allowed? If we look at oxygen, oxygen is N equals two, and it cannot accommodate an expanded octet. Does this make sense to everyone? So expanded octets only apply to N equals three and below. Okay, so let's take a look at sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is a very interesting example. So sulfur contributes six electrons, oxygen contributes six electrons, and we have four oxygens, and hydrogen contributes two electrons. That gives us 32 electrons to work with. Sulfur is our central atom, and we're gonna surround it with four oxygens, and we're gonna place our hydrogens on on our oxygens. In general, when you're looking at acids, you want to bond your hydrogen to oxygen. We'll talk about oxyacids later on in this chapter. So now that we have our rough skeleton, we'll form one bond each. And right now we're just pretending like expanded octets don't factor in at all since right now we're just drawing our basic Lewis structure. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So we've used up 12 electrons. We have 20 electrons remaining. Now, where do we place our lone pair electrons? What atoms need additional lone pair electrons? Oxygen, yep. So we'll add 
lone pair electrons to each oxygen to complete its octet. In this case, we've used up 6, 12, 16, 20 electrons. So this is the structure that you would draw if you did not consider expanded octets. Now, if we look at the formal charge of sulfur, if we look at the formal charge of sulfur, we'll begin to see something a little bit interesting. So what is the formal charge of sulfur? We take six minus four, that gives us plus two. And the formal charge of oxygen is equal to six minus one minus six, which is negative one. So we have a set of negative formal charges adjacent to a very large positive formal charge. How can we minimize formal charges? What can we form to minimize formal charges? What can we form if we want to minimize formal charges? Bonds, yep. So we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to kick down a lone pair from each of our negative oxygens and we're going to form an expanded octet structure for sulfuric acid that looks something like this. And the reason for that, and as we'll see quite dramatically, is that now looking at sulfur, the formal charge of sulfur is equal to six minus six, which is zero. So one case where we've one case where we invoke an expanded octet is in cases where it would minimize formal charges. So the expanded octet structure is more correct as we've minimized the formal charges on each of our atoms. Does that make sense? Okay, so just to, just to reiterate this idea, to minimize formal charges, double and triple bonds can be formed that would lead to an expanded octet structure. So for sulfuric acid, if we we're thinking from our previous general chemistry course, we'd probably draw a structure that looks something like this. As we've discussed, this has very large formal charges where we have negative formal charges on oxygen and a large positive formal charge on sulfur. So to fix this issue, we adopt an expanded octet structure that in turn minimizes our formal charges. And as a result, this expanded octet structure, since it is allowed, is preferred. Now, remember, you can only invoke the expanded octet because sulfur is in the third row and below. Expanded octets only apply in the third row and below. So for example, and this is a very important example because it highlights a mistake that students often begin to make. If we look for example, at ozone, which is O3, it looks a little bit like this. Now, even though we have a negative formal charge on, on oxygen and a positive formal charge on oxygen, can we go ahead? Can I go ahead and just like I did for sulfuric acid, can I go ahead and draw a structure like this? And is this, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this structure that I've drawn okay? Can I invoke an expanded octet for oxygen? Oxygen is N equals two. So I just want you in your notes to just put a big, big cross over this. You can't invoke an expanded octet unless your element actually has accessible D orbitals that can be used for bonding in the valence shell. Okay, 
just to make sure we don't start seeing expanded octet structures in cases where they're not permitted. So what I want you to do now is I'd like you to revisit sulfur dioxide and I'd like you to tell me after you've drawn a full Lewis structure accounting for expanded octets, I'd like you to tell me the number of double bonds present in sulfur dioxide. And you'll need to draw a Lewis structure for sulfur dioxide following expanded octet and formal charge rules in order to answer this question fully. You stop when you have a formal charge of zero or your formal charge distribution is such that you've minimized your formal charges and you've placed negative formal charges preferentially on electronegative atoms and positive formal charges on less electronegative atoms. You also stop once you've formed a total of six bonds as a maximum. And we'll discuss this example in about three to four minutes. Let's try to get some responses in the chat and we'll discuss in about a minute and a half to two minutes. Okay, so let's look at this example. So sulfur dioxide, sulfur has six electrons, oxygen has six electrons, and we have two oxygens. That gives us 18 electrons. We place sulfur as our central atom, and we surround it with two oxygen atoms. Then, just like traditionally, we form one bond each. So we've used up four electrons. That gives us 14 electrons. Now what we do, is we add lone pairs first to our oxygen atoms and then to our sulfur atom. That removes our electrons. Now my question to everyone is, does sulfur have a complete octet? Does sulfur have a complete octet? 
No. So how many additional bonds do we need? How many additional bonds do we need? Ah, I see one person saying two, another person saying one. So for the person who says two bonds, you're correct, but we'll get to that actually. So this is our initial structure, just following the octet rule. Okay, now looking at the formal charge of sulfur, we see we have a formal charge of six minus three minus two, which is plus one, and a formal charge of oxygen of six minus six minus one, which is minus one. So we have sulfur plus oxygen minus. Now, how can we minimize our formal charges? How can we minimize our formal charges? Can we make a structure with smaller formal charges? Can we, how do we minimize formal charges? in this case? What can we do to minimize formal charges? Just like in our previous example, what do, what do we need to do? And let's try to get some responses in the chat. If I wanted to reduce these formal charges, what can I do? And don't be shy if you have a question on this. We can add bonds, exactly right. So we're gonna take one of our lone pairs and we're gonna invoke an expanded octet and we're gonna form an additional double bond. Perfect. So now if we look at the formal charges of each of our atoms, so now if we look, for example, at the formal charge of sulfur, we have six minus four minus two, or a formal charge of zero, while the formal charge of oxygen is six minus four minus two, which is also zero. So this expanded octet structure has minimized formal charges and overall is more representative of the actual structure of sulfur dioxide. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, so let's do a few more examples. So I'll do these first I'll do the first example and you'll do the next two. So sulfur in this case has a total of 10 electrons around it in SO2 to answer the question in the chat. Does that make sense? No, as long as you're meeting the bare minimum of a, of a complete octet, when you invoke an expanded octet, um, you're mainly looking at formal charge considerations. You don't need to have a, a, you don't need to have, for example, 12 electrons or any specific number. If, if you have more than eight electrons and your formal charges are minimized when you're invoking an expanded octet, the structure is perfectly acceptable. Perfect. So let's look at an example, and this may seem like deja vu. Uh, chlorine dioxide with a positive charge. So our number of electrons for chlorine is equal to seven electrons. For oxygen, we have six electrons times two. That gives us 19 electrons. Minus one for our plus one charge. That gives us 18 electrons. Our central atom is gonna be chlorine. We surround it with two oxygens, and again, we form one bond each. 
We've used up four electrons. We have 14 electrons remaining. We'll then add our lone pairs to oxygen and chlorine. We're now out of electrons. Does chlorine have a complete octet? Does chlorine have a complete octet as written? No, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of our lone pairs on oxygen and kick it down in order to form a double bond, okay? That in turn gives us the following structure. If we look at the formal charge of oxygen, we have a formal charge of negative one. If we look at the formal charge of chlorine, we have a bit of a disaster in that we have a formal charge of seven minus three minus two, which is plus two. So then, how do we minimize formal charges when we have an adjacent negative and positive formal charge? How do we minimize formal charges? What can we do? We need to form another bond between oxygen and chlorine. That in turn gives us the following expanded octet structure. Now, just in case you are curious, just in case you are curious, this structure is actually isoelectronic and is almost identical, it's identical in the total number of electrons to sulfur dioxide. So this is our complete expanded octet structure for chlorine dioxide cation. Any questions on this example? If we don't have any questions, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at the following two formulas. I'd like you to draw a Lewis structure invoking the expanded octet if necessary. And I'd like you to tell me the number of lone pairs on the central atom. I'd like you to tell me the number of lone pairs on the central atom. And you're also welcome to share drawings of your structures in the chat, and I'd be happy to provide feedback. Yes. So in the previous example, just to go back and address, the formal charge of this chlorine is plus one, because formal charge would be equal to seven minus four minus two, which is plus one. Did that answer your question? Perfect. So let's work on the following two examples and let's try to draw some Lewis structures for the following two examples. And to help me check your work, you're more than welcome to message me in the chat with your proposed number of lone pairs on the central atom. You can message me your proposed structure. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to address. And we'll discuss these two examples in about five to six minutes. And let's try to get a few responses in the chat, just so that way I can check in and see how everyone is doing. <laughs> 
And let's try to get a few responses in the chat. Once you've drawn your Lewis structure, you'll be able to answer these two questions. And we'll discuss this example in about three to four minutes. I would double check your formal charge calculation and you're, you are correct in that for the first structure, your formal charges are quite large and you can minimize your formal charges by forming additional bonds and invoking an expanded octet. The overall charge of your molecule is given by the total charge the total charge is different than the formal charge of an individual atom. But your goal in all cases is to reduce your formal charges as much as possible. And you stop once your formal charges are as small as possible, or if you have negative formal charges that are small on your most electronegative atoms and positive formal charges on your least electronegative atoms. Does that make sense? Perfect. And we'll discuss this example in about two to three minutes. And let's try to get a few more responses in the chat for each of these two structures, or just some more questions in the chat, as I'd be happy to help everyone work through this problem. And we'll discuss and provide some rep representative examples in about a minute and a half to two minutes. Yes, yes, 
expanded octets allow for more than eight electrons around your central atom. Yep. Yep, exactly right. And if you've minimized formal charges, you should get a formal charge in your central atom, typically pretty close to, to zero. Okay, so let's discuss this example. And I find a lot of the, the questions and a lot of the, the um, sort of processes that are built into drawing expanded octet Lewis structures or tackling any problem are best revealed by working through a problem and noticing where things seem odd, where things need clarification. So let's look at ClO2, which is chlorite. So chlorine contributes seven electrons, oxygen contributes six electrons times two, that gives us 19 electrons. We add one because we have a negative one charge. So we have 20 electrons to work with. We put chlorine as our central atom and surround it with two oxygen atoms. And now charge plays a huge role. So even though we just changed the charge, these two Lewis structures that we're about to draw are completely different from the previous example. So we're gonna form one bond each. That gives us 16 electrons to work with. Where do we place our lone pair electrons? Where do we place our lone pair electrons? What atoms have incomplete octets? Oxygen, so we place six electrons on each oxygen. So we used up 12 electrons. We have four electrons remaining. Where do we place our last two elect? Where do we place our last four electrons? Where do we place our last pair of electrons? Chlorine. Okay. So if you were in, for example, Chem 107 and you were asked to write a Lewis structure, this is probably the Lewis structure that you draw. It's not wrong. It fulfills the octet rule. It certainly looks reasonable. But if we look at the formal charges, the formal charge of oxygen is six minus six minus one, which is negative one. And the formal charge of chlorine is equal to seven minus two minus four, which is plus one. Now, if we have adjacent opposite formal charges, how can we minimize our formal charges? What do we do? How do we minimize our formal charges? What do we do? We're gonna add a bond, okay? So that in turn gives us the following structure. Okay, now looking at our formal charges, now looking at our formal charge, the formal charge of this leftmost oxygen is still minus one, but the formal charge of chlorine is equal to seven minus three minus four, which is zero. And the formal charge of oxygen is equal to six minus four minus two, which is zero. So we now have a complete structure for chlorite anion that invokes an expanded octet, but minimizes formal charges. Does that make sense? Any questions on this example? Okay, so let's keep going now. 
So for BRO3 or bromate anion, let's repeat this process. So bromine contributes seven electron, oxygen contributes six electrons, and we have three oxygens. That gives us 25 electrons plus one. We have 26 electrons total. So now what we're going to do, we're gonna place bromine as our central atom surround it with our three oxygen atoms, and then we're gonna form one bond each. That gives us 20 electrons. Then we place our lone pair electrons, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Then the last two go on bromine. Again, we have a structure with a complete octet, but looking at our formal charges, the formal charge of oxygen is six, minus six minus one, which is negative one. And the formal charge of bromine is equal to seven minus three minus two, which is plus two. So we have a bit of a disaster on our hands right now. So how do we minimize formal charges? How many bonds do we need to make? How many bonds do we need to make? Well, if we have a plus two charge on bromine, how do we, min how do we get rid of that plus two formal charge? we need to form two bonds, exactly right. And that in turn gives us the following expanded octet structure. So as we can see very clearly, the formal charge of this oxygen is six minus four minus two, which is zero. The formal charge of bromine is seven minus five minus two, which is zero. And the formal charge of this rightmost oxygen is still minus one. So we've now drawn an expanded octet structure that minimizes formal charges. And most importantly, it minimizes formal charges by invoking the expanded octet rule. Do these examples make sense? Is everyone comfortable with these examples? Okay, so let's keep going now. And I'll do the first example for this series and you'll do the next two. For this following compound, this is a bit of a surprising example and really starts to peel back the curtain. Remember how we had this whole discussion, noble gases aren't very reactive. Well, if you really force noble gases and use pretty strong reaction conditions, you can generate pretty unique derivatives containing noble gases. These compounds, which are derivatives of xenon, are quite interesting, both from a structure and reactivity standpoint. So I need your help here. How many electrons does xenon contribute? How many valence electrons does xenon contribute? Eight. So we have eight electrons. Oxygen is six electrons. Fluorine is seven electrons and we have four. So we have 28 plus eight, 36 plus six is 42. Okay, 
Okay, so now that we have 42 electrons, what is our central atom going to be? What's our least electronegative non-hydrogen atom? And just as, a, as like an overriding rule, in general, your expanded octet atom will be your central atom in most cases. So what's our central atom gonna be? So what's our least electronegative non-hydrogen atom? Least electronegative. What's our least electronegative non-hydrogen atom that can accommodate an expanded octet? So fluorine is pretty electronegative, so it's likely going to be an outer atom. What's our least electronegative atom? Let's try to get some responses in the chat. Xenon, exactly. So weird, right? But don't worry. The reason why I like this example is, is, is it's always important in chemistry when, you're, when you see all these rules and you see all these concepts that are explained as absolute rules. There are always exceptions, but we can still look at these exceptions and write reasonable depictions of their structure, and we can slowly start to understand these unique compounds. Okay, so we're going to surround xenon with all of our atoms, and we are going to form one bond each. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we now have 32 electrons remaining. Now, where do we start placing our electrons? Which atoms currently have an incomplete octet? Fluorine, yep. So each fluorine atom is going to get six electrons. As, and each oxygen atom is going to get six electrons. So we've used up six, 10, six 12, 18, 24, 30 electrons. We now have two electrons remaining. Where do we place our last two electrons? Xenon, yep. We place our last two electrons on xenon, and xenon has the maximum allowed amount of electrons of 12 surrounding electrons. Well, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Well, has 12 surrounding electrons currently, and we've used up all of our electrons. Now let's check formal charges. Now let's check formal charges. So the formal charge of oxygen, six minus six minus one is negative one. The formal charge of xenon is equal to eight minus five minus two, which is plus one. Okay, now my question to all of you is, can we minimize our formal charges in some way? Can we minimize our formal charges some way? Uh, so 12 isn't necessarily a, so the, the 12 electron limit is not necessarily a hard limit. It's a hard limit in terms of the amount of single bonds and lone pairs that you can form, but it's not a hard limit into the number of double bonds that you can form. So you can form additional double bonds here. And if we formed a double bond, would that minimize our formal charges? If we formed another double bond between oxygen and xenon, would we minimize our formal charges? Yes, so we can kick down our lone pair and we can form the following compound. 
for the following correct Lewis structure. This is a bit of a weird compound. The, that, that limit of 12 electrons specifically applies to single bonding and lone pair electrons rather than double bonded electrons because double bonding electrons are found in a different orbital. So this is our structure for the following xenon oxide. It's quite an interesting compound when you think about it because it has a noble gas and an expanded octet. Okay, so let's keep going now and let's look at the following two structures and let's try to write out valid Lewis structures for each of the following formulas. And I'd like you to tell me again the number of lone pairs on our central atom. So don't be shy to write out the Lewis structures and submit your responses in the chat or ask any questions that you have in the chat. And we'll discuss this example in about five to six minutes. Practice really does make perfect for these sorts of problems. and we'll discuss this example in another four to five minutes. Don't be shy to message me in, your, in the chat with your proposed response for the number of lone pair electrons on the central atom for each of the following compounds. 
So for antimony pentachloride, looking at the response I see in the chat. So for antimony pentachloride, the number of lone pairs that I see calculated in the chat looks perfectly reasonable. And we'll discuss this example in about another three minutes. Yeah, you don't have to make any modifications if the formal charges are all zero and they add up to the total charge. Okay, so let's discuss this example. So for antimony, antimony is a 5A element. It contributes five electrons. Chlorine contributes seven electrons and we have five chlorines. That gives us 40 electrons to work with. We put antimony in the center and we surround it with our five chlorine atoms. Then we form one bond each We've used up 10 electrons. We have 30 electrons remaining. And now all we have to do is place our lone pairs on chlorine. Okay, so we've fulfilled the octet rule for antimony and chlorine. And if we look at our formal charges, we see that the formal charge for chlorine is equal to seven minus six minus one is zero. And the formal charge for antimony is five minus five, which gives us a formal charge of zero. Does this make sense to everyone so far? Does this make sense to everyone so far? We don't have to make any changes because our formal charges are zero and the octet rule is obeyed and there's no reason for us to invoke expanded octets. So let's look at the next example of bromine pentafluoride. So bromine contributes seven electrons. Fluorine contributes seven electrons times five. That gives us 42 electrons. We put bromine in the center and we surround it with five fluorines. That uses up 10 electrons. We have 32 electrons remaining. Now, all we have to do is fulfill the octet for fluorine. So we give six electrons to each fluorine atom. And that in turn gives us two electrons remaining. Where do our last electrons go? So where do we place our last two electrons? We have two electrons remaining. They go on the bromine, exactly right. Now we check our structure. The formal charge of bromine is equal to seven minus five minus two, which gives us a formal charge of zero. Okay, the formal charge of fluorine is equal to seven minus six minus one, which gives us zero. 
perfect. So we don't have to make any changes. We've fulfilled the octet rule and our formal charges look good. Any questions on this example? The responses I'm seeing in the chat look great so far. Let's keep going now and let's look at special cases for oxy acids. So for oxy acids, they're the form XOH. Your hydrogen atoms are always bonded to oxygen and you only place one hydrogen atom on each oxygen atom. So for example, let's look at hypochlorous acid. Hydrogen contributes one electron. Chlorine contributes seven electrons. Oxygen contributes six electrons. That gives us 14 electrons total. What is our central atom? What's the least electronegative atom? Chlorine, yep. Chlorine is less electronegative than oxygen. In general, for oxy acids, oxygen will almost never be a central atom. Okay, then we're going to surround chlorine with oxygen. And following our rule for oxy acids, where do we place our hydrogen atom? On oxygen or chlorine? Oxygen, yep. Perfect. Okay, we form one bond each. We now have 10 electrons remaining. And we then place our lone pairs, six, on chlor six electrons on chlorine, four electrons on oxygen. We have zero electrons remaining. And checking our formal charges, the formal charge of chlorine is seven minus six minus one, which is zero. And the formal charge of oxygen is six minus four minus two which is also zero. So now that we've seen an example for oxy acid Lewis structures, are there any questions that I can address? Are there any questions that I can address? If not, let's work on the following example, and I'd like you to draw a Lewis structure for the following molecule, and I'd like you to message me in the chat the number of single bonds, the number of single bonds to phosphorus in your final Lewis structure. Or you can message me your entire structure directly in the chat as an image, or you can write your structure on this whiteboard using the annotate feature. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, and we'll discuss this example in about three to four minutes. And if you have any questions, I'd like to see a few responses in the chat, and we'll discuss in about two to three minutes. 
and we'll discuss this example in another minute and a half. Would anyone like to volunteer in the chat how many single bonds are associated with phosphorus in your correct Lewis structure for This isn't this isn't phos, phosphorus acid. This is an entirely different compound. Okay, so let's discuss this example. So hydrogen is one electron, phosphorus is five electrons, oxygen is six electrons, and we have three of them. Okay, so we have 18 plus five plus one gives us 24. Okay, we put phosphorus as our central atom. We surround it with our three oxygens, and where do we put our hydrogen? Do we attach our hydrogen to phosphorus or oxygen? Now this rule is based on formal charges. So if you had to take a guess, where would I place my hydrogen atom? And as the chat points out, yes, the hydrogen atom is attached to oxygen. Doesn't matter which one. We formed one bond each. So we used up two, four, six, eight electrons. We have 16 electrons remaining. Now let's add our lone pair electrons to each oxygen atom. 6, 12, 4, yep, 6, 12, 16, we have zero electrons remaining. Does phosphorus have a complete octet? Does phosphorus have a complete octet? Does phosphorus have a complete octet? No. So what we're going to do is we're going to need to take one of our lone pairs and form a double bond. And now my question for all of you is, why am I choosing the oxygen atoms on the right for this process? Why don't I use the oxygen atom on the left? Would someone like to provide the reason? The oxygen with the hydrogen is full. Um, that, that is somewhat, that, that, that's on the right track. That's on the right track. And by full, essentially what, what the, the another, one, another way to think about it is that the oxygen on the left, if you formed another bond, you'd introduce a positive formal charge on oxygen and it would, neg it would affect the formal charge and generate undesired formal charges. So for example, the following structure is the preferred structure for this compound. Because if we, for example, formed a double bond with the oxygen on the left, we'd have a positive formal charge and that's generally not preferred. Let me just check something really quickly for our electron count. 18, 23, 24, 2, 4, 6, 8, 16, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. But we're not done. We're not done. We're not done. So does anyone notice something odd about this structure? Does anyone notice something odd about this structure? Let's look at it for a moment. And I'd like you just to always be attentive as to what is the formal charge on each of our atoms. So what's the formal charge on phosphorus? Plus one, exactly right. We have five minus four, which gives us plus one. The formal charge of this oxygen is minus one. So to minimize formal charges, what should we do? To minimize formal charges, what should we do? Add a bond, add a bond from minus to plus. And you know, as a somewhat intuitive heuristic, opposite, I like to think as my like pneumatic or mnemonic, 
opposite charges attract. So I want to minimize my formal charges. So then I form a bond between my atom with a negative formal charge and my atom with a positive formal charge. And that in turn gives us the this final structure. There we go. So this structure has minimized formal charges and this would be the most appropriate structure for the following oxy acid. Does this example make sense to everyone? Okay, so let's do a few more examples. So I'll, whoops, one moment. Sorry for the small lag in one note. So I'll start us off with this next example for sulfurous acid. So sulfur contributes six electrons, oxygen contributes six electrons, and we have three oxygens, that gives us 18. Hydrogen contributes two electrons, so in total, we have 26 electrons to work with. What atom is our central atom? What atom is our central atom? Sulfur, okay. We then surround it with our three oxygen atoms. And where do we place our hydrogens, on oxygen or sulfur? We're going to place our hydrogen atoms on oxygen. Okay, now we're going to form one bond each. One, two, three, four, five. We used up 10 electrons. We have six electrons remaining. Oh, 16, sorry. Now that we have 16 electrons remaining, we're going to place our lone pairs on each of our oxygen atoms. So we used up 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. Just checking something really quickly. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. Yeah, okay. We have two electrons remaining. And yes, exactly right. We need two more electrons on sulfur. And that's where our last two electrons go. Perfect. Now, my question to all of you is, looking at formal charges, the charge on this sulfur is six minus five, sorry, six minus three minus two, which is plus one. The formal charge on this oxygen is minus one. So what do we do to minimize formal charges? What do we do to minimize formal charges? How can we minimize formal charges? What do we do? We form a bond between oxygen and sulfur. That in turn gives us the following Lewis structure. Again, invoking an expanded octet in this case. Does this example make sense to everyone? Perfect. Okay. So let's take a moment and let's spend about five, three to five minutes working on the following example. 
I'd like you to draw a valid Lewis structure for phosphoric acid. And I'd like you to message me in the chat the number of double bonds to phosphorus. So we'll spend about three to five minutes on this example. And if you have any questions when drawing this structure, don't be shy to ask. Practice makes perfect for these sorts of problems. And we'll discuss this example in about another minute and a half to two minutes. And we'll discuss this example in about another minute. I'd like to see a few more responses in the chat and a few more structures submitted in the chat, just so that way I can provide some feedback. So don't be shy to share your proposed responses. And if not, we'll discuss momentarily. I would double check your formal charge assignment for oxygen, but your response for the number of double bonds looks reasonable. So let's discuss this example. So phosphorus has five electrons, oxygen has six electrons and we have four oxygens and hydrogen has three electrons. Okay, so adding up, so adding up our total number of electrons that in turn gives us 32 electrons to work with. We put phosphorus as our central atom and we surround it with our four oxygens. Now, where do our hydrogens go? Where do we place our hydrogens? Where do we place our hydrogens? On the oxygen atom. So we place each of our three hydrogens on each oxygen atom. 
and now we form one bond each. So we formed two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, we used up 14 electrons. So in turn, that means we have 18 electrons remaining. We now add our lone pairs to each oxygen, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. We're out of electrons and now it looks on the onset we fulfilled the octet rule, but if we look at our formal charges, we notice a problem. The formal charge of oxygen is six minus six minus one, which is negative one. And looking at phosphorus, the formal charge of phosphorus is equal to five minus four, which is plus one. So to minimize our formal charges, what do we do? How do we minimize our formal charges? What, what do we do? We form a double bond with our topmost oxygen atom. And that in turn gives us the following structure. Where we've minimized our formal charges by invoking an expanded octet. It's not surprising that many oxy acids have expanded octet structures because they often contain n equals three and below elements. Any questions on this example? So the corollary to expanded octets are incomplete octets. Incomplete octets are commonly seen for group 2a and 3a elements and Essentially, these structures don't follow the octet rule. And the reason for that is the structure that satisfies the octet rule leads to an unfavorable distribution of formal charges. So for example, boron trifluoride, boron contributes three electrons, fluorine contributes seven electrons, and we have three fluorines. That gives us 24 electrons. We put boron in the center, and we surround it with our three fluorines and form one bond each. That in turn gives us 18 electrons remaining, which we then place on each of our fluorine atoms. Now, this structure as drawn does not follow the octet rule, but this structure is preferred. Why is this structure preferred? Well, if we look at our alternative structure where we fulfilled the octet rule, I just want you to comment, what do you notice about the formal charges? So comparing these two structures, what do we notice about our formal charges? And let's calculate it. So in the top case, our formal charge on boron is three minus three, which is zero, and the formal charge of fluorine is seven minus six minus one, which is zero. In our second structure, in our, in our second structure, the formal charge of boron is equal to three minus four, which is negative one. That's already setting off some red flags. Metals don't typically have negative formal charges. The formal charge of fluorine as well is seven minus two minus four, which is plus one. Now, looking at these two structures, the, the reason why the incomplete octet structure is preferred is, is because the incomplete octet structure minimizes formal charges. A, pos a positive fluorine atom and a negative bromine atom in terms of formal charges are not favorable at all. Bromine is not very electronegative. Fluorine is viciously electronegative. So you'd much rather prefer to have an incomplete octet rather than unfavorable formal charges. Does this make sense? 
Okay, so let's take a moment and let's try to work and write out a structure for beryllium dichloride. And I'd like you to tell me the number of bonds to beryllium in your final structure. And we'll discuss this example in about three minutes. And if you have any questions, don't be shy to share your questions in the chat. And don't be shy to share your responses or questions in the chat, and we'll discuss in about another minute and a half. And remember, the octet rule takes less priority than minimizing formal charges. Okay, so let's discuss this example. So beryllium, 2A element, contributes two electrons. Chlorine is a 7A element, contributes seven electrons. We have two chlorines. This gives us a total of 16 electrons to work with. We put beryllium as our central atom and surround it with our two chlorines. And then we place lone pair electrons on chlorine. That in turn means we've used up 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. We've used up all of our electrons. And this structure, if we look at our formal charge of chlorine, is equal to 7 minus 6 minus 1 is 0. And the formal charge of beryllium is equal to 2 minus 2, which is 0. As this incomplete oct octet structure, which contains a 3A element, has minimized formal charges, this is our complete structure for beryllium dichloride. The reason why we don't have our structure that follows the octet rule is that if we look at the formal charges for this structure, we see that the formal charge of chlorine is equal to seven minus four minus two, which is plus one, and the formal charge of beryllium, which is equal to two minus four, which is minus two. Does this make sense to everyone so far? Okay. So let's keep going now and let's talk about radicals. So radicals are species with a single unpaired electron. They're typically unstable and reactive. So for example, nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen contributes five electrons, oxygen contributes six electrons. So that in turn, we place nitrogen and oxygen. We form one bond that gives us so 11, that gives us nine electrons. 
we then place our lone pairs on nitrogen followed by oxygen. So we've used up all of our nine electrons and now we form an additional bond that in turn gives us the following structure. Now, in general, we prefer to place radicals on oxygen atoms, though you can just as easily draw a structure with the radical on nitrogen, since the radical is in fact delocalized. And I'd say in terms of formal charges, this structure with the radical on the nitrogen is preferred. So when calculating formal charges, you're gonna count the radical electron as one lone pair. So what do I mean by that? If we're calculating the formal charge of nitrogen, we have a, a group number of five, we have two bonds, and how many electrons do we see on nitrogen? How many lone, lone pair, in quotes, electrons do we see on nitrogen? Yeah, we have one and a half lone pairs or a total of three lone pair electrons. That's why I like in the formula to think about it in terms of lone pair electrons, because it makes this calculation easier for radicals. Okay, so that gives us a formal charge of nitrogen of zero. Any questions on this idea? Okay, so let's keep going now. And I'd like you to try to write out a valid Lewis structure for the following radical. And I'd like you to tell me the number of electrons on oxygen in the following structure. And we'll discuss this example momentarily. And we'll discuss this example in about another minute and a half to two minutes. Okay, so let's discuss this example. So chlorine contributes seven electrons, oxygen contributes six electrons. We draw out, we have 13 electrons to work with. 
we form a bond between chlorine and oxygen, and then we add our lone pair electrons. So chlorine gets six and oxygen gets five. Now the reason for that is if we look at our formal charges, the formal charge of chlorine is equal to seven minus six minus one is zero. And the formal charge of oxygen is equal to six minus four, oh sorry, minus five, since we have five electrons, minus one for our bonds, which gives us a formal charge of zero. Does this example make sense to everyone so far? Any questions on this example? Okay, so let's keep going. Let's talk a little bit about electronegativity and bond polarity. So as a review, electronegativity, fluorine's the king of electronegativity, and electronegativity describes how readily a nucleus attracts electron density in a chemical bond. So when, while electrons in a covalent bond are shared, the electrons certainly are not evenly distributed between the two atoms. Now, for those wondering the link between electronegativity and redox reactions that we've observed, we'd note that there's another parameter that follows and is and can be that follows periodic trends which is oxidation potential which describes how readily an atom becomes oxidized the less electronegative elements so less electronegative elements have large oxidation potentials. And as a result, are readily oxidized. So electronegativity increases going towards fluorine and decreases going away from fluorine. Less electronegative elements have large, oxi large oxidation potentials and are more readily able to give their electrons. Okay, so let's talk about electronegativity in the context of chemical bonding. So we can think of chemical bonding as a continuum based on delta En, which is the difference in electronegativity. If your difference in electronegativity is less than 0 0.4, you can think of your bond almost as like it's a pure covalent bond or a nonpolar covalent bond. And this involves an equal sharing of electrons. This primarily comes up when you have two atoms of the same element where your difference in electronegativity is zero, or if you're looking at a carbon-hydrogen bond, in which case looking at a carbon-hydrogen bond, the difference in electronegativity is about 0 0.3, which is less than 0 0.4. So even if there is a small difference in electronegativity, it's not significant enough to lead to a polar bond. Now, a little bit more interesting is if your difference in electronegativity is greater than 0 0.4, you have what's known as a polar covalent bond. This entails an unequal sharing of electrons. So for example, carbon and oxygen, oxygen is more electronegative. So as a result, where will our electron density in our bond prefer to lie, on carbon or oxygen? Will we have more electron density on carbon or oxygen? Thinking about the fact that oxygen is more electronegative. 
So where is our electron density gonna lie on? Carbon or oxygen? If oxygen is more electronegative, which atom will have more electron density from this chemical bond? Oxygen, yep. So we'd have more electron density on oxygen, less on carbon. And since this oxygen atom has an excess of electron density, it will start to accumulate a partial negative charge while carbon will accumulate a partial positive charge. So we can represent polarized bonds or bonds containing an uneven sharing of electrons and an uneven distribution of charge using dipole notation where we draw an arrow pointing from our least electronegative element or the delta plus element in our bond to the most electronegative atom in our bond. Does this make sense to everyone? So polar covalent bonds, we have a difference in electronegativity. Oxygen is pulling the electron density more strongly towards itself. It has more of the electron density from our chemical bond. It builds up this partial negative charge. Our bond becomes polarized. We have a separation of partial charges, an uneven distribution of charges. An so uneven the, distribution of electrons, sorry. Yes. Sorry. So for these, we have to actually know the, the electronegativity number? Uh, not entirely. Essentially, as long as there's a difference in electronegativity, as long as your two elements are different, the difference in electronegativity will overwhelmingly be greater than 0.4 for two nonmetals. The only exception is a carbon hydrogen bond or a bond between two identical elements. Does that make sense? Okay, I guess um, I see it better because of when you do the, the 3.4 minus the 2.4. Yeah. That gives, that tells you, right, that it's a polar yeah. convict. And one, one thing that I'd want you to consider is that you can be familiar with each of these electronegativity numbers. However, qualitatively, if your atoms are different, whichever atom is closer to fluorine will be more electronegative. And for all the electronegativity values that you can calculate for a pair of nonmetals, they'll almost always be greater than 0.4 for most, for most nonmetal polar bonds. The only exception, if your atoms are different, would be a carbon-hydrogen bond. So in essence, if you have two different nonmetals bonded together, the bond will almost always be polarized. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see that. Thank you. Perfect. So once you end up with a very large difference in electronegativity, this primarily occurs if you have a metal plus a non-metal, you end up crossing a threshold and you now have an ionic bond. So an ionic bond entails a transfer of electrons to yield a cation and an anion. So for example, for sodium fluoride, we don't have a sharing of electrons, no, no, no. Instead, sodium is not very electronegative and fluorine is so viciously electronegative that there is a transfer of electrons. Remember how we discussed the Born-Haber cycle? This sort of described, this, the Born-Haber cycle describes this process of generating an ionic solid from the pure elements. And as a result, instead of having a covalent bond, instead what we have is an ionic bond, which is an electrostatic interaction between a positively charged cation and a negatively charged anion. Does that example make sense to everyone? Okay, so let's keep going now and let's talk a little bit about bond dipoles. So atoms with the different electronegativity values will share electrons unequally. Now, the electron density is uneven with the higher amount of electron density located on your more electronegative atom. 
So bond dipoles indicate partial charges with our partial negative charge is assigned to the more electronegative atom, the atom with more electron density. Okay. For polar bonds, we indicate the distribution of electron density using delta notation. Now the arrow points towards your more electronegative atom, the atom with the partial negative charge, and the arrow points away from the least electronegative atom or the atom with a partial positive charge. So for example, if we're looking at hydrofluoric acid, HF, fluorine is more electronegative, so it gets a delta minus. Hydrogen is less electronegative, so it gets a delta plus. And we draw an arrow pointing from hydrogen to fluorine. So here we have a polar bond. Does this example make sense to everyone? Any questions on this idea of bond polarity? Your bond dipole points from the least electronegative atom to the most electronegative atom. Okay. So let's do some practice. So using delta notation, let's indicate the bond polarity for the following bonds. So for a fluorine-chlorine bond, we know fluorine is more electronegative so our arrow will point towards fluorine. For a carbon-oxygen bond, we know oxygen is more electronegative, so our arrow will point towards oxygen. I'd like you to work on the following three examples, and I'd like you to indicate to me where your bond dipole is pointing and draw your bond dipoles and indicate the most electronegative atom in our chemical bond. And we'll discuss this example in about two to three minutes. And the responses I see in the chat look great so far. And we'll discuss. Um, when comparing sulfur and oxygen, remember electronegativity increases as you move up the periodic table. So oxygen is actually slightly more electronegative than sulfur. And we'll discuss this example in about another minute. Okay, so let's discuss this example. So for a carbon-nitrogen bond, nitrogen is more electronegative. For a nitrogen-chlorine bond, let's get, the, let's get the class to help out. Which atom is more electronegative, nitrogen or chlorine? 
which atom is more electronegative, nitrogen or chlorine? Nitrogen, actually, if you look at the periodic table. It's a little bit odd, but remember, if you think about electronegativity, it increases as you move up and to the right on the periodic table. What about a sulfur-oxygen bond? Which atom is more electronegative in a sulfur-oxygen bond? Which atom is more electronegative, sulfur or oxygen? Oxygen, yep. So our dipole will point towards oxygen. Okay. So now that we are familiar with this idea of bond polarity, let's do a few more examples. So for a sulfur chlorine bond, chlorine is farther to the right in the periodic table. So our bond dipole will point towards chlorine. Let's look at the phosphorus oxygen and chlorine oxygen bond. So for the phosphorus oxygen bond, I'm gonna need your help in the chat. What? atom is more electronegative. In a phosphorus oxygen bond, oxygen is more electronegative. Yep, that is correct. And in a chlorine oxygen bond, if you look at the periodic table, it, remembering that electronegativity increases as you move up and to the right on the periodic table, which atom is more electronegative, chlorine or oxygen? Oxygen, exactly right. So our bond dipole would be polarized towards oxygen. Do these examples make sense so far? It's really critical to be able to identify polar bonds in order to begin to identify molecular polarity. Okay, so let's keep going now. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna now switch to the next note set and we'll start to discuss molecular shape and molecular polarity. So I'm just gonna pause this 